Greetings, colleagues, students, and people who are joining us from around the world. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor George Abungu from the Okella Abungu Heritage Cons Consultants. This is part of a series dedicated to the trafficking and destruction of Africans' cultural heritage. Um, Dr. Abungu um, is invited here by the co-sponsors, including the HU Center for African Studies, the Howard Department for African Studies, the Howard Archaeology Working Group, the Archaeological Institute of America, and archaeology in the community. Professor George Abungu um, is a Cambridge-trained archaeologist, an Emeritus Director General of the National Museums of Kenya, a recipient of several awards and distinctions. He has also published in several venues, including illicit trafficking and heritage, restitution and heritage and sustainable uh, development. It, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Abungu. Thank you very much, Flori. Uh, thank you very much for all the participants who are attending the meeting for taking your time to listen to me. Uh, in this very important discussion that looks at illicit trafficking and destruction of uh, Africa's heritage. Uh, I hope that uh, you will walk with me this journey, a journey of discussion of uh, Africa's heritage and how over the years it has found challenges. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I would like to start by saying that the continent of Africa is a continent that is extremely rich in heritage. Uh, the diversity is great and uh, it's both cultural, natural, movable, immovable, tangible and intangible. And the heritage of Africa uh, is so intertwined that culture and nature is always intertwined tangible and intangible is very intertwined. So each gives meaning to the other. Next, please. Uh, and heritage itself is about people. Uh, the diversity of heritage uh, represents the diversity of our humanity. And, and I, I borrowed this uh, saying that cultural diversity is one of the roots of development as necessary for humankind as biodiversity is for nature. So heritage is absolutely crucial for our, 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 our being. Uh, some people, because of the discussions on uh, illicit trafficking and restitution, have started to say that Africans probably do not want to share their heritage with others. But I want to say that genuine sharing of heritage is part of creating international partnerships and common understanding among humanity. And nothing sums up that better than UNESCO's motto at its founding in 1946, which said that war begins in the minds of men and it is in the minds of men that peace must be constructed. Now, when the fathers and mothers of UNESCO were setting it up, uh, culture or heritage was crucial for that, that if you understand others' heritage, then you'll be able to appreciate them. So it is important. And for Africans, it is central to our being. Next, please. And the diversity of heritage is so pronounced. Uh, you have the built heritage. For example, you can see the obelisks of Ethiopia, the rock-hewn churches of Lalibela, you know, Aksum Lalibela. Uh, you go to Sudan and you see those temples just like the ones that you have in Egypt. It's, it's diversified, it's great, it's rich. Next, please. And it's also not just about heritage for the sake of heritage. Some of the heritage that we have have given countries their national identity. For example, a place like Zimbabwe, the country of Zimbabwe, is one of the few places that has actually got its name from one of the sites, a world heritage, Great Zimbabwe. Great Zimbabwe basically means the big house of stones. And it, has, it inspired the fight for independence. And that independence, the country that was originally called Rhodesia renamed itself Zimbabwe. 
That is how powerful heritage is in Africa. A place like Robben Island, which you see at the bottom with Nelson Mandela, was a place of confinement for people who had different political opinions, people who wanted freedom. And people like Mandela and his colleagues were jailed here. But when they were released, they said that they wanted peace, they wanted forgiveness, they wanted one country. So today, Robben Island, which is a place of confinement, has become a place of reconciliation and peacemaking. That is how heritage is so important. Next, please. Next. And heritage is also usable. When we talk of sustainability, we use the past for the present. Go back, please. We use the past for the present. We appreciate, we transform. So you can see that there is a continuation. Oh, please. We go back to the other slide that we've just been talking about on heritage and sustainability. Yes, this one. So you can see that the creation continues. I think there's a problem. Uh, but what that slide was trying to show you was basically that heritage is renewed and it's living and is part of our thinking in terms of sustainability. Now, coming to the question of looting and theft, this is a historical challenge. Looting, theft, illicit import and export of property are practices that have been on uh, and they have taken place in museums, in archaeological sites, religious buildings like the ones I was showing you in libraries, ancient manuscripts like the ones from Timbuktu in Mali, and so on. So the phenomenon itself of illicit traffic of cultural property is rooted in history of exploitation of Africa, of exploitation of its resources. And it is a constant loss, regular loss of Africa heritage remains one of the main challenges of the continent. As you can see from this slide, the history of the looting, the right-hand slide shows the British army sitting on some of the looted material from Benin uh, Empire in, 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 in Nigeria after it had been looted. Of late, this material has become very contested and there's a lot of discussion and it's actually led the process in terms of the discussion on restitution. Next, please. What are the causes of illicit trafficking? Uh, some of the ones we'll see as the discussion goes on have been pointed out like loopholes in legal and regulatory systems so that legal frameworks are not up to date probably. Weaknesses of institutions in charge of heritage protection in various countries uh, like museums, which are not capable to protect their heritage. There is also corruption that goes along in every sector. There is poverty and helplessness in society at some stages. Poverty that to some extent had been created by powers that be because Af Africa has been a place of exploitation and extraction. Uh, lack of awareness in some instances, not in all instances, but there are lack of awareness, particularly among the youth. There are also social political crises and armed conflict. You've had different parts of Africa having a lot of conflicts. But even more so, there is the demand on the international art market where made in Africa is required everywhere. And today online sales bring quite new challenges to us. Now, all these constitute in the long term a real threat to historical testimonies and collective memory and cultural identity of the peoples of Africa. This is something that we have to understand. It is a threat. Next, please. So, as I've said, illicit traffic is just as old as colonialism in the continent. And colonialism, as we know, uh, were, uh, promoted acts of exploitation, of subjugation. In some instances, and there are many places like Nam uh, Namibia, Tanzania, where you had genocide, there was dominated labor, there was extraction of resources, of even of heritage. Even the human spirit was extracted by making people believe that whatever they produced was not good enough. 
So heritage extraction, appropriation, and transfer were carried out through very well organized uh, military expeditions. And sometimes museums in the West were part of this colonial project that carried this. this, this, this. Uh, we should know this. Next, please. Now, for example, to just give you a word of one of the people who was involved, a French uh, individual called Michel Reyes, he said that we pilfer from the Africans under the pretext of teaching others how to love them and get to know their culture. That is, when all is said and done, to train even more ethnographers, ethnographers, so they can head off to encounter them and love and pilfer from them as well. Of course, now, if you hear such a language, there is definitely a problem, historical problem. And this problem passes to the present. Next, please. So today, the continent continues to suffer where its material are taken away, illegally digging, theft, clandestine transfers, plunder, theft, illicit traffic, and destruction of heritage in Africa uh, continues unabated. Uh, and it's ripped off, it's sold abroad, and sometimes it's destroyed at home due to greed, ignorance, and sometimes even the new and the emergent religious fundamentalism and conflicts also create problems. Uh, many of you have heard about Boko Haram, you know, in Nigeria and that particular area of Chad region, destroying heritage just to get, you know, uh, some publicity and also make money for more conflict. Next, please. So while looting uh, of illicit of cultural property is not new phenomenon in Africa, uh, times have seen the destruction of places of significance. Uh, and, and, and this is sort of, today we see it in such a way that it's like destroying the identities and histories, particularly in places of conflicts. And we've seen that in many places. The objects destroyed and illicit traded represent the collective, collective heritage of humanity, the achievements, and therefore their destruction is, is a crime. But if you go to places, particularly in Africa, uh, we have had some experiences, particularly in the North, with the Arab Spring in the North of Africa, there are also ongoing conflicts in the Sahel region in Western and Central Africa that are you know, talked about in the newspapers all the time. In DRC, in South Sudan, that has also had a lot of conflicts. Today, there's peace coming in. Central African Republic is burning. Somalia has had problems for the last 20 years. These are areas of very active illicit trafficking in cultural property. Next, please. So wars and conflicts in the continent tend to feed this Western world market, including with sacred objects. And so they, they torment those who value and cherish this heritage. As uh, Professor Chika uh, once observed uh, in the New York Times, talking about the mother, her mother, his mother, and he said, recently my 72 year old mother was looking at a glossy catalog of Igbo sculptures from major European collections, most of which were acquired during the Nigerian Biafran War of the late 1960s. She told me that the disappearance of similar sculptures from her hometown shrines in Southern Nigeria and the end of the associated festivals was one of her most painful memories of the war. It touches people. One thing that people who acquire this heritage do not understand is that some of this heritage is so close to the people. They have meanings. They define ways in which we live, in which we operate, in which we do our things on a daily basis. Next, please. And this particular sentiment or feeling was repeated thousands of kilometers away in Kenya when Vigangos, Vigangos are sacred carved human figures, which had been stolen and taken to the US to museums there, a lot of them found their way uh, 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 to California and other states. And two of them were brought back some years back. And one of them was of a very senior chief. 
And uh, when this Kigango, this particular post that you see on the bottom, on the right hand side, when it was brought back, one of the relatives of this person who had died and who was represented in this particular Kigango said that we knew he had gone for a long journey, but that one day he would return back, referring to this particular piece as him. During his absence, we, the family, were befell with calamities such as famine, disease, and general bad luck. But now that is back, those will be things of the past. So this is what the African continent is actually dealing with. Something beyond material culture, the way we look at it from the Western point of view. Not just an object of a museum, but one with spirit and that affects daily life. Something that Western curators refuse to understand up to now. Next, please. In Mali, for example, where there has been a lot of problems, a lot of problems and they've lost, you know, in the Sahel area, a lot of material. An informant was cited as saying that there is no state in Southern Libya, there is no state in Northern Niger, and there is no state in Northern Mali. If you know what you are doing, you can do what you want. Another said the Malian state is too weak to meaningfully wage a battle against illicit trafficking and the continued corruption incentive presented by illicit traffic further enfeebles the state. While another one stated that we have become a mafia culture. Everyone wants to be part of it. Trafficking and crime has torn the social fabric that holds the societies together. Where does then this lead us? It is widespread. It is everywhere because of the problems that we experience. Next, please. Now, if you move just a, little, a few miles away to Ivory Coast in 2011, thieves made off with historical gold jewelry, masks and statues estimated at 6 million US dollars. And you can see the number of the objects that were stolen. This is when there was conflicts between political parties and individuals. Next, please. Now these priceless collections, priceless collections do represent a country's and a people's identities and past achievements. They have the potential of defining and reaffirming, for example, this country's future after the Dutch are settled in the unfortunate and long-standing conflicts that they had experienced. And this was summed up by the director then, who said, for a country like Ivory Coast, which at the moment really needs to reaffirm its identity, to rediscover its own values, it is really a tragic loss. This really shows the power of heritage that often ends in the hands of the looters. But those who engage in such plunder and theft should also understand that they violate Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights which affirms the right to freely participate in cultural rights of the community and to enjoy the arts and share in the scientific advancement and its benefits. I don't understand whether they understand that, but this is something that I think needs to be brought up. We need to universalize the language. We need to go beyond looking at it as just a loss of a small community within the village into something that is globally a language that is globally understood. Next, please. Now, Egypt, everybody knows about the Egypt and its riches during the, you know, in the 20, 2013, when the Arab Spring was at its top. It was reported in the USA Today that probably so many of you read that the Egyptian tomb raiders thrive after Arab Spring. Ancient burial sites looted systematically as securities fall off. And we know that that time things were bad. Dozens of burials untouched for millennia lie open and ransacked for their content. Mounds of earth signal the location of other illicit excavations. 
Monica Hanna, one of the archaeologists, Egyptian archaeologists, looking at one of the sites in Dashur, a site that is 4,500 years old, a royal necropolis, said, work from sunset to sunrise. It opens, it is open, it is in front of everyone. So they, they dig, they just disorganize because there are those who need the material. Once it's dug, there are people willing to buy and sell. One unarmed custodian, Hussein, said, how am I supposed to approach an armed gang when none of us have weapons? But Egypt, as it was now that time, and now, although controlled, but they're still looting, is just an example of one of these problems that we are talking about. Next, please. So many reasons have been given for this rampant illicit traffic and cultural property in Africa, uh, ranging, as I've said, from legal framework to poverty, you know, ignorance. But the situation appears to be a little bit complex. It's a little bit complex because Africa is included in this global conflict, but it's also included in the global trade in narcotics and arms. And we've realized that this go hand in hand with the trade in cultural property. So when you're talking about the Sahel and other places, when there's conflict, small arms, the small arms are accompanied by cultural material when they move. So on the edges of this catastrophic situation, we have beneficiaries, those who are willing to buy and those who are willing you know, to sell the spoils of war and confusion. We are at a crossroad. We are at a crossroad. The disease of collecting the rare, what appears to be a loss of human respect for other traditions is with us. So we have reached an unprecedented and an acceptable limit, particularly in Africa, because it's every part of the continent. It takes place. And it asks us questions. What should we be able to, what can, how can we be able to arrest this? From the colonial time, when it was done in a different way, to the present where it is so well organized. Next, please. But we know that some of the governments have been unable to install war, laws and order resulting on these challenges of protection and management of the heritage. And uh, we also know that conflicts, people thrive or con there's the trafficking and traffickers thrive in places of conflicts. And sometimes some people also in the name of the love for the heritage go to rural areas claiming that they're doing justice for the heritage. Now we know that in places where there are large pieces like doors, I showed you uh, where we're talking about the heritage and sustainabilities, the carved doors like the ones that you found on the East African coast among the Swahili. Where those large pieces are, the traffickers have gone as far as dismantling, dismembering them, and packaging them and transporting them in lorries and loading them into containers. And they end up in New York or in Los Angeles or somewhere in London or in Geneva. Now, in, if transporting of heritage from one location to the other is a legal challenge, they often also have developed ways in which they hide them in bulky goods, such as in trucks that are taking coffee maize, tea, hides and skin, or even building materials, sand and so on. And they continue to bribe their way as they move on. That is how it works out. Next, please. To deal with this alarming situation, concerned parties have to develop strategies. Strategies that are going to be national, that are going to be regional, and that are going to be international so that we can reduce and control the effects of, of this. For example, I'm happy to say that the African Union, which is the continental body that brings all the 54 countries in Africa, declared the 2021 as a year of arts, culture, and heritage 
levers for development. And one of the things they are looking at is this destruction and illicit traffic of heritage. I'm also happy to say that they have extended this year from 2021 to 2022 to still be the year of arts, culture, and heritage levers for development. That means that we will focus more and try to address these issues. There is, they are also developed what they call the African Union model law. This also is geared towards tackling some of these particular problems. And currently, I am one of the people who has been engaged, involved, and in being involved with a colleague of mine, um, of ours, uh, Felwin Sa, whom you know, who together with Savoy developed uh, that document on restitution. Uh, myself and him have been asked to develop a position paper for the African Union that would help other countries to be able to negotiate the issue of restitution as well as tackle illicit trafficking. Next, please. So those are some of the issues, things that have been moving on. Next. There is also UNESCO. UNESCO, in collaboration with other technical partners, have been doing quite some work. You know, the World uh, Customs Organization and Interpol. ICOM, the International Council of Museums, has a red list, which, you know, they put their, 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 their items that have been stolen. Next, please. Next. So all this appear, the, 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 the illicit trafficking is taking place, but there are some things, some, some, some things that are also being put in place. There are well-meaning programs in place. UNESCO also has relevant conventions, 1954 convention uh, that deals with places of conflicts where there was war, how to deal with materials at that particular time in places of war. 1970 con convention that deals with issues of restitution and return. And the 2001 convention uh, that deals with underwater archeology span uh, uh, and many other uh, conventions. ICOM Red List, which I've already mentioned. There is the Association for Research into Crime Against Art and SAFE, which is also based in New York. There's Interpol, which I've mentioned. So there are some of these uh, bodies that are dealing. So it's not that they are not there. They are there, but the problem still persists. Next, please. Next. So today we still have this problem continuing. And according to Interpol, the pillage of cultural objects and the trade in these objects now rank with arms and drugs as one of the three most serious illicit international trading activities. But what strategies do, have we put in place to tackle these issues, especially in a conflict, a, conflict a, 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 a continent like Africa that is prone to so much conflict? Next, please. So due to longstanding historical experiences of colonialism, sometimes we find that even within the governments, the people who are entrusted to be able to manage this heritage still have doubts because they have not changed their mindset that was actually implanted there that their heritage is not as good as any other. So this is a problem. There is also the legal protection, you know, lack of legal protection. Then the traffickers have ready market, especially in the Western art markets, private and public galleries. Next, please. And museums, of course. So these are some of the, 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 the issues that we're following. There is also the issues of poverty. There's a community awareness. Although in many places, communities are aware, but in some places where there's helplessness, they will always you know, be willing to sell. And then the population is rising with the highest percentage of the youth who probably do not, are not very close to their heritage. And because of this, this group of people have no attachment to the heritage and they want to survive. They want jobs, there are no jobs. They will do anything to you know, be part of this. Next, please. So you have all these policies, legislation, uh, uh, dealing with illicit trafficking. I think that there is need 
because few African countries, there are up to 17 African countries who have not signed the convention. So there is need to be able to try, apart from looking at the legal frameworks that are within the continent, looking at the issues of empowering the people economically, there is also need for ratification of the conventions. We know that the 1972 convention, basically, uh, when it comes to restitution, does not automatically, it's, it, it's, it doesn't bring things that have been stolen before 1970, but it does help people, countries to negotiate some of these things back. So there is need for this, uh, to look at some of these weaknesses that we have. Next, please. I'll try to move a bit fast. There's also the challenge with climate change. And uh, today, as we talk, there's COP, you know, going on in Glasgow. Uh, I'm not very sure whether they're discussing issues of uh, heritage itself and issues of want and how this affect communities. And especially in dry areas like the deserts, like Sahel, traditional methods of survival are being challenged and alternative sources of survival are scarce. So people are turning into what they have and when there is also conflict, this is easier for them to sell what they have. Next, please. So as I've said, in places of chaos and conflicts, it thrives. In cases of war and conflicts, the beneficiaries, okay? Those who are fighting, it also helps them to restock their fighting mechanisms. So unless the guns are silenced as a continent, we are going to continue seeing this particular problem. Next, please. And uh, there are also other problems, of course, uh, while communities need awareness and most, most community are aware, but they need empowerment for alternative sources of gainful living, apart from selling their heritage. But we also have the customs, we have the police, we have the immigration. They need proper training that are embedded in the curriculum. So law enforcement agency also, we realize are some of the least remunerated people. Salaries are small. So they get tempted. These need to be addressed. If you have a corrupt and unreliable law enforcement organs, it's very difficult to control this, this, these issues. And in Africa, we still do have that. So that is one thing that we need to look at. Next, please. And as a quick money maker in an environment characterized poverty, helplessness, and want, communities are constantly tempted to sell a subsidy for survival. So you have archaeological sites being dug, artifacts are being sold. Then there is the concept of heritage as priceless, which is a very Western concept. It, you cannot put price on it. Huh? No monetized. It can't be monetized. It doesn't work here. Hmm? You cannot preserve when you are hungry. So there is need to talk another language. A language, what are the values, the intrinsic values that that heritage, when you hold it, it has with you. For example, a place like Mali, they have introduced what they call the heritage bank, where you can actually take your heritage and use as collateral for loans. That is maybe one of the languages we need to start talking about, and then we'll be dealing with that. But when we talk about priceless and so it's heritage for the sake of heritage, it becomes very difficult to deal with that. Next, please. Uh, the keepers of the, the, the heritage, as I've also said, they are also least predominated in Africa. Uh, and sometimes even the museums, some of the heritage, when they return back in the museums, they find their way back. And this has happened particularly in places like DRC. So unless governments take cultural property and heritage seriously and compensate these custodians, the vice will continue. And the youth, there is definitely very little knowledge among the youth about the heritage of the past. I think there is need for embedding this in the curriculum so that that gap, that generational gap in knowledge and interest is dealt with. Because the elders are going through natural attrition and they're leaving behind no knowledge and no interest. And so you having 
nations of young people who have no attachment to the past. And yet you expect them to be able to protect that heritage that gives them identity and what they are. Next, please. There's also the role of the art market, which we have seen. Uh, the art market in the West has a loud voice. And to some extent, sometimes they, they, they control. I mean, government's decisions are, uh, uh, and politics are sometimes controlled by people who have the resources. There is also the shopping that has gone online, open sales worldwide. Huh? eBay and uh, other, 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 other selling, you know? And of course the appetite for African art in the art market continues to increase. How do you deal with that? Next, please. So I have already said uh, the 1970 uh, convention is important and it provides that platform and it needs to be looked at. And through the 1970 convention, apart from the others that I have explained, like the legal framework that needs to be looked at, remuneration for people, finding alternative ways, uh, uh, mindset change, uh, developing the curriculums that will you know, conform with some of these things. The 1970 convention is important in that through that, it may strengthen, help us in strengthening the institutional and legal capacities and the preparation of standard forms that we use uh, for questions of restitution. And once you start restituting, there, there will be a change because people will know that if they steal, there is also a possibility of return back. And of course, there is the issues of inventories. There is need for serious inventories. There are some countries where inventories are not very serious. So losses, destruction, whatever takes place, people don't understand. And lastly, there is also the sense to instill the need for conducting preventive conservation, particularly for museums, so that although we don't lose through destruction, through ignorance. If implemented, some of these things may go a long way in addressing some of the problems associated with illicit traffic of cultural property and its destruction. And, and, and uh, I've gone through this very quickly. Uh, it's a, a huge topic. It's a topic that now you know, involves everybody, and especially since the issue of restitution and return sort of cropped up. Uh, but I think that I will leave it at this point. So next slide, please. And uh, if there are any questions, we can be able to discuss. Next, please. And this slide just shows you some of the Vigango that have been returned from uh, uh, overseas being put back into their sacred place uh, to take part their rightful place in the society and to play their rightful role, right, uh, 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 rightful place. Thank you. And uh, I think after this, we can now open the discussion. If Flori, that's okay with you. Thank you, Professor Bungu. That was a very enlightening and um, interesting uh, presentation. Um, I wanted to start off with just one question and then I see there's already five questions um, waiting for you. But my one question is for our students. Um, at this point, since we're crafting or um, inspiring young leaders, is there anything that they can do at the moment to get involved? Um, and also if they're thinking about um, this is something that they're very interested in, in terms of pursuing a path or moving towards a career in protecting African heritage. Um, what would be your recommendations for students? I think, I think that uh, that's, that's a very interesting question. Look at, let me start from the other, 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 other area. Look at the question of um, climate change. The process is now being driven by the youth. The youth voice has been heard in Glasgow and every other place. And so the youth have the loudest voice. And I think that they can, they can come in. I think that they need to take heritage as a serious subject that goes beyond heritage for the sake of heritage. But looking at heritage as something that does not only, is not only livable, particularly for Africa, 
but it's intertwined with the whole setup of the African political, social, and economic thinking. It is not a separate thing from those. More so, if you take places like museums, museums in Africa are very different from museums in Europe and America, North America, because they deal with issues that those places don't deal with. They deal with community needs, with political issues, with issues of human rights, with issues of social and economic well being, with issues of education. So I think that what I would really ask them to do is to develop an interest in looking at the way in which African heritage has evolved and what role African heritage plays in the societies. And probably work on that because if you work on that, then you will understand that when we talk about question of sustainability, you cannot talk about economic sustainability without talking about heritage sustainability, without talking about culture, because you have to understand the people, the way they operate for you to be able to understand them. Even in terms of politics, we have a lot of conflicts. For example, Africans have had very strong uh, uh, economic, uh, not, not economic, but uh, heritage of peace. You know, some of this heritage of peace, some of the, 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 the implements, today find themselves in museums, lying there as, as whatever, as, as, you know, as collections. But you cannot have peace where there's conflict without having this heritage and without using it. But because of the earlier, you know, uh, 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 dismissal of the heritage, both by, you know, through Christianity and other, you know, Western thinking, you know, they are, they, they are, that, that, that mindset needs to be changed so that for you to be able to understand and create development within Africa and political systems that will work, you also need to understand African culture. And so for the youth who are studying, I think that what they need to understand is that if you are looking at Africa and understanding, looking at African heritage, you are looking at something that goes beyond an exhibition in a museum or an art in an art gallery. You are looking at something that actually defines the, the, the people, the communities. I can see that there is a colleague here from Rwanda. When there was genocide in Rwanda, they have been dealing with this. You have the gacheches, these are courts, local courts. They use traditional means of, of conflict resolution. They use the traditional ways of punishment and it has succeeded, okay? It's, it's, it's succeeding. So this is the way we need to look at it. So those students who are interested in Africa, whether in terms of economics, whether in terms of politics or in terms of of, 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 of social studies or cultural studies or archaeology, I think that they need to go back and understand that lying behind all these things, lying behind their, 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 their work, there is that traditional or indigenous knowledge systems that they can be able to benefit out and that they would be able at the end of the day to apply in any subject that they are looking at when they're dealing with Africa. I don't know whether I've under answered you, but I know I've gone around it and it's, it's such a wide area, but I'm just trying to, to, to show you how important heritage it, it is uh, and the way in which it has been looked at the West and the way we need to demystify and to change the mindset and to look at it from the lens of the African person. And Africa is not one country, there are 54 countries, but they do share some of these things, the spirituality and the way they look at their heritage because it affects and they leave it on a daily basis. Great, yeah, I'm, I hope that our students can see the uh, relationships between all the various perspectives and the topics that you raised and how looking at heritage is really um, important for things like development. But I wanted to uh, follow up with some of the questions that have been posed in the Q and A. Uh, Lala Christ says, how do you propose we save and preserve African heritage from illegal um, trafficking and looting. I think I, I, I have answered part of those questions in, 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 in my, my, 
my, my discussion. I said that we need to develop strategies that are both you know, national, regional, continental, because there are countries which have got good legal frameworks. But if you have a neighbor that does not have that and hosts these illicit traffickers, it's very easy for them. So there's need for collaboration. I've also mentioned a continental approach to this particular issue and the African Union through the African Union law and also through you know, the Africa we want, the agenda 2623 that African Union is developing. Those are issues that we need to look at. Uh, there is also the 1970 convention that I've mentioned. And of course, uh, there is uh, many other associated instruments that go with that. The, the, uh, so we need to, as African countries to be able to sign the signatories so that we can have a voice at the highest table. Uh, Interpol already has already been mentioned. Uh, uh, so th there, are, there are many. And of course, at local level, we need to be able to carry out inventory so that we know what we have. We need to be able to uh, have statistics, good statistics, so that when things are stolen, we can be able to give statistics of what has been stolen and what has not and how we are able to protect that. We need to look at our legal framework so that we have laws that are punishing people found doing these things. And we need to compensate those people who are actually taking care of the heritage. And lastly, we need also to introduce some of these heritage studies into the curriculum so that the youth can be able to understand and appreciate their heritage and become the protectors. And of course, the communities must also be able to gain from their heritage. You cannot just talk of heritage for the sake of it, but you must be able to develop ways in which heritage can be able to create wealth. And lastly, we must be able to silence the guns in Africa. And I think this is a continental challenge that all Africa has to work together to silence those guns because uh, illicit traffic thrives in places of, of conflicts. The next question is from Cortia, and she asks about um, the re resistance from European museums to return African heritage. Yes, there's a lot of resistance. And uh, this, this is a pity because I think as long as, as far as 2004, when you know, some museums were claiming that they're universal museums, I, I personally wrote a very strong uh, comment on this. I don't believe in that. Uh, because I realized that they were trying to evade from this discussion and not return. There have been a lot of excuses claiming that African museums are not capable of uh, managing or the communities will not be able to manage their heritage when it is returned back, that they need to put up proper structures and all these things, or that this heritage has become international and therefore moving it away, you know, will disrupt everything and so the, I mean, the, the global world with the people migrating, so Africans who are in Europe or in America can also enjoy these things. I, I, I don't buy that, uh, especially for heritage that is of very strong spiritual or symbolic significance to the community it has come from. Nobody is casting, asking for everybody to be returned. Nobody is asking for that. Illicit traffic must be destroyed, must be finished. Return must be on those cases where the communities have returned, uh, have requested. And let me tell you one thing. Why would European or American museums claim that the heritage, if returned back to Africa, will get destroyed, will not be taken care of? Were they taken in the first place because they were not being taken care of? It's an irrelevant question because they are being taken care of. Secondly, it is the role of the Africans, it is their privilege as the creators of this heritage that they are made to do whatever they want to do with that heritage when it's returned back, even to bury them back because some of this heritage is not supposed to be alive. They are disturbing and disrupting people's lives. So if they decide to go and bury them in the forest, that is their own choice. So I think the question of whether they are capable or not or should be refusing to return them because they can't manage them is irrelevant. And it should be very loud and clear that the person who has stolen your thing should not tell you how to deal with it or give you condition for return. Uh, the next question is from Lauren Frank. She says, what is the root of Mali developing into a mafia culture? Pardon? What is the root of Mali developing into a mafia culture? 
This was a quote from an indiv a Malian guy. I'm not saying that Malia has developed into a mafia culture, but this was a, a, a quote from one of the Malians who was being interviewed because he was seeing what was happening. What has happened is that there has been a lot of trade uh, in narcotics coming from Southern part of America, going into the Gulf uh, of Guinea, and then finding its way with the small arms into Mali, and then into the Sahel, and then all the way, you know, with all this disruption. The other problem has been when the conflict, when there was conflict in, 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 uh, in, in Libya, a lot of people who used to be in the system there during Gaddafi's time left with a lot of arms. And all these found themselves in the Sahel region. And Mali is strategically placed in that particular area. And Northern Mali falls within that particular state. And for years, they've been asking for separation from the Southern part. So they have more or less used that. And you remember that there were people who actually went and destroyed some of the sites like Timbuktu and Gao. And uh, one of the people, the leader of this was actually taken to the International Criminal Court in The Hague and has been jailed because of that. Uh, so, the, the, and, and, and of late, there has been a lot of coups. I mean, there have been coups every year in Mali. Uh, and even as we talk now, Mali is run by a military junta. So th there is a problem. Now in this particular conflicting area, in this area where there is drug and, and, and illicit traffic on guns and other things, the youth, particularly who are the majority, would find an easy way of making money. And once they make money, who are they to listen to the elders? Because most of these areas, the traditional systems of management and politics is, is, is very traditional, but the elders. So the youth start now not to listen to the elder. And that creates a breakdown in the societal order. And that could in the long term lead into a mafia where money and guns matter than the traditional systems of living together as a people and as a society. So that is, is a problem. It is a problem that has to be dealt with. And it's not a problem of Mali alone. It's not a problem of the Sahel alone. It's an international problem. The French are there. There are other people who are there. I don't know whether they're doing it the right way, but I think that the international community needs to look at this problem, not as a problem of Mali, but as a problem of the continent and a problem of the world. And it has to be solved. Okay, the next question is, Interpol is often consulted with extreme matters of security and safety, but they are called upon by other government and law enforcements. If a conflict in Africa is perpetuated by the government in law enforcement, how can citizens best get the help of Interpol or other international agencies? Interpol doesn't deal with, 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 with conflicts. Interpol deals mostly with, yeah, it's the international police, you know? So they deal mostly with um, uh, illicit trafficking in different kinds of things. And of course, we have to understand that these conflicts are taking place in, 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 states, in the states that are independent. Uh, so there is all this issue of the sovereignty, internal problems. Uh, but as we have seen, there are other areas where the international community has actually intervened. And I think that where there is need to intervene, there should be intervention. For example, take Somalia. Uh, it has been in conflict for the last 20 years. The United Nations is there. And without the United Nations, I think Somalia probably been a very bad state. And so you have the forces from Africa, the, uh, the Amazon, uh, the forces that are taking care of uh, security, uh, maybe not on the, 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 the countryside, but in the major cities. And that has brought some calm, but the calm needs to be permanent. It needs, we need to sort out the, the political situations in this area. And I don't think that Interpol or international community or other organizations are going to create this, 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 this situation of, of peace for the people. It is the people themselves. They have to go back to their roots. They have to go back and decide that they have to live together. And the politicians must be able to be accountable for whatever they're doing. So the people must also come up and say, you know, enough is enough, and the solution has to be within. It has to come from within. And even this illicit traffic is just one small part of a bigger problem. I've mentioned drug trafficking, and I've mentioned trafficking in, uh, in, in, in arms. 
which is inflaming all these things. So the African Union has got its role to play. The United Nations has got its role to play. Other bodies like uh, you know uh, uh, European Union and and other bodies they they do have their their their, their roles to play. Uh, but at the end of the day, it is the communities themselves, it's the people themselves, it's the people of those countries that have at one stage to say enough enough and take the law take 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 their their future in their own hands. Not Interpol, not any other people coming from outside. Um, and this is why I think that. It is important that we need to develop interest uh, in, 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 in African heritage, even for students, to do it as an academic exercise, as a knowledge generation exercise, so that people can be able to understand that heritage is important, even in issues of conflict resolution, even in issues of sharing of resources because of climate change, even in issues of creating and making a society that has get, got an identity and that believes in one destiny. I think it is, it is very important. I think heritage is crucial for creating nations, especially in the African continent. Alicia Morris asks, what can be done to reduce demand by Westerners? As long as they are supporting the market, people will try to provide objects for sale illegally. Yes. What should be done is there are many ways in which it should be done. One, uh, nobody should be above the law. Uh, if, if you are found in the West with material that has illicitly been, 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 you know, has been, been transported, the law should take its course. You should be jailed. The Western countries must put in practice and in law, you know, proper mechanisms of dealing with this including online sales. They are not above the law and they cannot evade this. So that is important. Secondly, museums that are holding illegally trafficked materials, apart from the shaming that they go through, they should also be held accountable. And those who are responsible and know should also face uh, the legal instruments that are in place. I think these are very important. And those powers, those traders who are trading illicit traffic with lots of money, should cease to influence the political systems uh, in their own countries in the West, where they have a voice. Uh, I think, I think, I think this this is absolutely important. And of course, there is also the element of uh, uh, other other elements apart from this. The issues of provenance research. We need to have the Western countries providing resources for provenance research so that we can be able to move on and identify some of these things. There is also the question of archives. Most of the archives of the stolen materials were taken to Europe at independence. They need to return, the archives are critical for us to understand what is where and what needs to be brought back. So I think that is absolutely important. And uh, the other one is that Western museums needs to cooperate with Southern museums, with museums from the South in their research, in their co-creation, in their co, co there must be a co-exhibition uh, and, and so that we can be able to develop partnerships, partnerships where we can be able to understand where the problems are and solve them amicably, rather than just shouting, you know, through Zooms and through other, other, other media. The next question is sort of related. Um, thinking of inventories as a step in preservation, is this not also a way Western students can provide assistance to African nations while learning about other cultures? Yes, inventories are very important because if you don't inventory, you don't know what you have. And of course, we would love very much, you know, Western uh, students be part of this, either as interns or, you know, working with uh, with with with, with uh, African students and African, you know, professionals. And uh, some of this has been going on for many years, and uh, a lot of work has, has has come out of this. But the question of knowledge generation and knowledge transfer, knowledge 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 sharing, is is not only from the north to the south; it is also from the south to the north. Now, currently, a lot of it is Western you know, students come to the South, they gather the knowledge, they go back, they got their degrees, and they forget about everything. Um, so there is need for you know, permanent development of permanent partnerships so that you truly believe that the people you work with in the South also deserve to have that knowledge that you have in the North, because you know, otherwise it's one-way exploitation. But I totally agree 
like inventory is one of them, research is another one of them, and even co-exhibition, as I've said, people develop exhibitions together with curators in the North and the South working together. The issue is about partnership. And as I've said, when it comes to issue of restitution, it is not about emptying museums in the West. It is about accepting that mistakes have been done and mistakes are being done and we need to correct it. And that there are some people in the South who are affected directly by the absence or by the, the detention of their heritage in institutions in the North or continued appropriation of their heritage illegally to be taken to the sources in the North that welcome those heritage without questioning. Uh, Parker Blackwell um, asks, in light of corruption at a governmental level, what other institutions might be necessary for implementing international policy like the 1970 convention at the local level? Thank you. Yes, you know, corruption is not only in Africa. Corruption is everywhere. I think even in the US, there's a lot of corruption. Uh, in Europe, there's a lot of corruption and we've seen that and, uh, you know, uh, but it's good that we are accepting that there is quite corruption in some levels because of different uh, uh, reasons. Uh, I think those are some of the things that needs to be dealt with. There are structures, there are some countries that have put anti-corruption, you know, uh, systems in place. So you have uh, the ethics and anti-corruption units that are dealing with those issues. I think that's a good thing. The laws must be implemented properly. I think we need to strengthen our legal, uh, not only legal frameworks, but legal structures, the judiciary, that they can do their works independently. And that when they find people who are corrupt and who are doing things that are illegal, that they do not uh, you know, um, look back, but they, they, they follow those. I think that the newspapers and the media needs to be in the forefront in shaming some of these things that uh, people who are uh, taking place in, in corruption so that people may know them. So there are many ways of dealing with corruption, but it's, it's a disease in the, in the fabric of society. And, and unless we deal with that, we, we, we are not going to move far. And, and also, as I said earlier on, acknowledging that so far, the heritage sector, especially the culture, the arts, has been given a raw deal. The government spent a lot of money in other sectors and other things than in this because of this mentality that, you know, uh, heritage is much more of a pleasure and pastime rather than something that matters in the life. I think we need to develop a language where heritage becomes part of the language of the World Bank, part of the language of the IMF, part of the language of the economics of the, of, of, of the world, so that those values that they hold, whether they are only intrinsic, you know, uh, intangible values, those values must be measured in terms of what they bring to society. If a particular heritage is able to help in reducing conflict, how much can we measure if that conflict took place so that we can quantify that? If it helps in reducing you know, uh, tension between communities and reducing policing within that particular area, how much money could have been used in policing the area? So, but this heritage, and, and museums have been able to create conducive atmosphere that brings society together. This is the way that I think we should be going, not just you know, putting things behind the glass cases and telling people to come and visit and that's all. Okay, so I think there's uh, two more questions. There were comments, uh, but the next question is, based on your extensive knowledge of the trafficking of African heritage, could you explain your position on how the trafficking of African heritage has allowed Africa's history to be seen in a negative perspective and or interpretation? I think, I think this is an interesting question, but I think the trafficking of African heritage is not recent. I mean, this is a continuation. And I did say that from the time of colonialism and you know, colonial uh, structure was based on the fact of belittling the others. Because if you are perceived to be very good, why bring changes? Why colonize? So the, the issue is that the mind, the, the people's mindsets were, were changed. They were made to feel inferior. And until we change that, it becomes a problem. And they could, then, then, then 
we had the missionaries and the missionaries said, oh, these are evil, you know, this, you have this material and all that. So they burnt a few here, but then majority of them, they took to their, their, their collections in Europe and America and others, and which are now being claimed to be part of the universal museum collections. So it means they were good. So I think that there is need to be a mindset change in Africa and other places. We need to decolonize the mind. We need to decolonize the practice. We need to decolonize our thinking so that we can be able to think differently of our heritage the way we are. We can be able to appreciate the role that heritage plays us. And we can be able to appreciate because it's not that we have to retain everything here. There's particular heritage that we sell outside there. There are heritage that have become ambassadors outside there. There are places where this heritage is recognized. And so the countries are recognized as the creators and the originators of this. And so we appreciate that. But when it comes to clandestine theft and illicit trafficking of heritage that means a lot to the nations and to the people and to the communities, irrespective of whatever it is, I think that in that case, we have to be very clear. I think that in that case, we have to say no. And I think I've mentioned ways in which I think that this can be dealt with. And uh, of course, the, I've said from national to international level, to bodies like UNESCO and Interpol, uh, you have uh, you know conventions, UNIDRO, UNIDRO 1995, it's one of the conventions that is also used. We need to be signatory to all those things so that together we can work together. But we need to be able to decolonize the thinking of about of our heritage. Because for many, many years, for about a hundred years, we were made to believe that our heritage is inferior and yet it was being sorted out and being taken in large quantities to those places, you know, that were claiming that our heritage was inferior. We'll end with uh, Frederick Winter's question. Um, thank you for this excellent and comprehensive presentation. What you describe for Africa is painfully familiar from situations in other parts of the world. For example, Iraq in the aftermath of the destabilization that followed the start of the war in 2003. How do you suggest dealing with this as a global instead of, or perhaps better, as well as a regional issue? Yes, I think, I think that's a good question. I think that uh, this is a, a global matter. Uh, I think that we need to recognize that. And I think that the dealers who are dealing with this heritage uh, must understand. Uh, Iraq suffered a lot um, after the wars. Uh, Syria has been one of the places that has suffered. That whole area, Lebanon and all those other places, they have suffered. And they're suffering even from the hands of the people who are claiming that they were going to help them. They become actually the conduits that trade this material. I think there is need for a, a concerted international approach through even the United Nations. Although this has been recognized, heritage as a heritage right, as a human right, indigenous communities rights. But I think that we need to go further and really look at it as a problem that is international. But we also have to localize it so that we deal with it from the local level uh, by strengthening our legal frameworks, by making sure that we cooperate with, you know, communities cooperate in this, by inventory, by providing them with facilities, by enlightening them, by creating awareness amongst them not to sell, uh, but also punishment. Punishment is very important that the countries must put in place ways in which they punish and that we need to put laws that specifically look at restitution, look at illicit traffic, not general laws that are looking at theft, okay? But specific laws that look at heritage as things that need to be dealt with, that needs to be addressed so that they have their own specific laws that address those ones with, with, with compensating uh, punishments that come with it in case you know there's a problem. But at the end of the day, I think we need to also have regional bodies also, you know, uh, incorporate this into the agenda, like the African Union is doing, uh, the West African uh, ECOWAS, uh, ECO the, the Economic Community of West Africa, ECOWAS, has come up with a very good stand on uh, restitution and illicit traffic. Uh, they have a policy on that. 
uh, we have regional organization in South America, in Asia, in, in even in Europe. The European Union, I think, has a stand on illicit trafficking, but they need to implement what they're saying. So, uh, and then above that, of course, is the, 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 the international organizations like UNESCO that are dealing with heritage, but also the United Nations itself, that when they're dealing with places in areas of conflicts and providing security and peace, that heritage should be part of that agenda. Thank you, Professor Abungu. That was very wonderful. And um, I'm sure the audience enjoyed hearing all your insights about this very important topic. Um, I want to thank all the co-sponsors and all the participants who signed in to listen to this very important lecture. Um, and I hope that you will join us uh, for future talks on the same topic. We plan to, this was our launching distinguished lecture um, and we plan to have more talks in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, I much appreciate it. And uh, goodbye to everybody. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.